Mr. Nigel Farage. Thank you, Donald, and good evening, everybody. Well, one of the big debates in the referendum is what would happen in the event of Brexit to all the EU citizens living in this country. And you'd have thought, listening to some people, that uh, Brexit meant they'd all get rounded up and sent away. And I made it very clear, all through the referendum and before, that we are not a banana republic. And that anybody that came to this country legally had the right to be here. I did say I thought I felt far too many had come, but they had come legally. Well, we voted Brexit to the surprise of everybody, and the government under Theresa May didn't really seem to know quite what to do. In fact, the impression was given very much that citizens' rights, EU citizens living here, and the fewer British citizens living in the EU, that somehow this was a bargaining chip. I said within a fortnight of of the Brexit referendum that I thought we should make one big offer. That being to say, if you've come legally, you can stay, but hereafter, that is not going to be the case. That didn't happen. Now, what we did learn in the negotiations that we've had so far... Uh, of course, which haven't been agreed, but what's been discussed so far was that the transitional period, which is, of course, supposed to last until the end of 2020, that during that transition period, any EU citizens arriving within that period would have full rights to stay. Now, I said, hang on, whoa, 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 whoa. We voted in the middle of June 16. This would be four and a half years after we'd voted to leave, under which there would still effectively be free movement. But now, today, of course, we've got the government telling us that they're preparing for a no-deal. And a leaked document, and there are going to be 83 of these documents, apparently, a leaked document picked up by the Daily Telegraph says that the Home Office plans to make an offer to existing EU residents who can remain in the EU in a no-deal scenario. This deal would extend to all 3.8 million EU migrants living in the UK. Note that number, 3.8. In the referendum, folks, we were talking about 3.5. So the longer this goes on, the bigger and bigger and bigger the number is. But also, under this no-deal scenario, the unilateral offer that Mrs May would make is not just for the 3.8 million to stay, but they would be able to bring their spouses and close family members from abroad to live in the UK. And that goes on, uh, you know, for the next five years, ten years, twenty years, or however long that might be. The government say they're trying to claim the high moral ground. Well, that was my purpose of doing this. I thought this was the one thing we could have put on the table and dared them absolutely dared them to say that British citizens didn't have the same right but to have a cut-off date. So there are problems now with this being offered at this stage. David Jones, a Eurosceptic Member of Parliament, former Brexit junior minister, said it's got to be reciprocal. We have large numbers of Britons in the EU and their interests have got to be reflected. We've got to look after our own people. So David Jones saying it must be reciprocal. And I've got one or two questions here. Because if there's no deal, folks, there'll be no transition. At least that's what the European Union have told us. So there's nothing in this document that suggests any cut-off date at all. In fact, I wonder whether the plan isn't just to keep free movement going for as long as possible. I've also got big questions here about benefits. Not just out-of-work benefits, but in-work benefits too. And again, the document says nothing about that. So I wonder, what do you think about this? I mean, you know, given, given that nothing, nothing is going to be demanded in terms of a reciprocal deal from the European Union, is the government right to take this issue off the table at this stage in the event of a no-deal Brexit? And if you think, well, actually, we have to take the moral high ground, whatever the circumstances, call 0345 6060 973. Or maybe, like David Jones, you think, no, we can't do this until we guarantee the rights of British citizens living across the rest of the EU, in which case text to 84850. And let me know what you think. I mean, do you think there'd be a transition period in the event of a no deal? Do you think there should be a cut-off date? Put on this somewhere at some point. Let me know. You can tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC. And, of course, you can watch us on Facebook and comment there too. Ruth is a brand-new caller to the show, and she lives in West Hampstead. Ruth, good evening. 
Hi, Mr Farage. Yeah, I absolutely agree with the government, actually, on this, and it's probably the first time I've agreed with them in the last two years about anything. Um, I, I have a friend, you know, a very, very good friend, my friend Alexandra. She's been over here for probably about 10 years and came here in very good faith from Romania. She's bright, she's funny, she's beautiful. Um, she's paid taxes. Why should her future be in threat? She came here in good faith. Yes, I mean, Ruth, that's the argument I've made all the way through the referendum ever and ever since. Those that came in good faith, legally, you know, we, we, we'd have to be a banana republic to revoke their rights. The problem is, Ruth, as I just mentioned, during the referendum, we were talking about 3.5 million. It's now 3.8 million. Uh, in a couple of years' time, it'll be 4.2 million or higher than that. At what point do we say enough's enough? Well, as you know that free movement will end when we leave the European Union. I don't so know. That will be. I d I, do you know what, Ruth? I genuinely, honestly, with this government, don't think it will. I've well, not I heard... Think you're being disingenuous. You know it has to end. No, I it don't. Will end. Well, I, well, let me tell you. Well, they've never said anything contrary to the fact that free movement will end. In fact, they've been saying that for the last two years. So why would you not believe that? I'm not because I don't believe anything Mrs. May says. Whatever she says or whatever she does tend to be the opposite things. I've not, Ruth. I promise you. you, you I promise you. you I have not seen. Believe? I have not seen a single proposal from this government at any point in the last two years, including the Brexit white paper that came out a couple of months back, there's not been a single proposal about what they're going to do to end free movement. Not oh, one. Come on. you, you know the people would, the, the will of the people would be outraged if they didn't end free movement if we leave the EU in next March. Of course that will happen. Uh, well, what? why have we not seen a single proposal? Because I think it's just a given. It's a given if we're leaving, free movement ends. We're not in the EU anymore. Why would we have free movement if we're not in the EU anymore? Well, we accepted unless, free... Unless they absolutely thought that not to have some kind of movement within the EU would sincerely damage our economy. Ah, that well, that's an argument they could make, well, of course. Do you, want, do you want to damage the economy, though? Is that what you want Oh, I've to seen do? plenty of damage done to the economy, Ruth. I've seen oh. plenty done by mass importation of unskilled labour, uh, which, frankly, uh, hasn't just driven down the wages for working people, has put massive pressure on our uh, social services. I think it's been very damaging in many, many ways. I think immigration well, needs to be selective. It doesn't seem to be that all of the research says that they are actually a net gain to the country. It doesn't so actually, Ruth. It that. doesn't actually, Ruth. What the research says, and the House of Lords spent months on this, what the House of Lords said was, overall, the economics were about neutral. All right? However, Ruth, I would make this argument. With a massively increased population, you have to build more roads. You have to build more schools. You have to build more hospitals. There is a capital cost there that never, ever gets priced into this. Well, I do see that maybe the, go the government actually needs to pull their finger out and put in mm. more infrastructure, which actually would increase productivity. But if, you're, if, so if, if, but if your population is rising because of low-skilled, relatively low-paid people yeah, paying, but... paying tiny amounts of tax, that does not pay for the hospitals. Well, the low-skilled people that come over here and help, in, for instance, in the care system or in nursing, I mean, how are we going to replace them? Well, how did we in manage... Well, I'll tell you what, Ruth, I mean, I've heard this argument again and again and again. You know, how did we manage before 2004? How did we manage before we let in eight, then ten communist countries to the European Union? We did. We had, you know, we had foreign worker schemes. People could come on a work permit and then leave. Our problem, Ruth... I think is we've confused that with the automatic right to settle and to bring your family. I mean, Ruth, your point is a salient one. People who voted Brexit wanted us to get some, some degree of control. This offer today is the generous offer that I thought should have been made two years ago. But nowhere... Nowhere here is a cut-off date of any kind of green. Anyway, well, Ruth... I, I think you're jumping the gun, Nigel. I really do. I, I think you need to actually calm down a bit and wait to see what Ruth, actually... not one single proposal, including the government's formal white paper. Anyway, thank you. And Ruth, for once, agrees with the government. What does David from Worksop make of this proposal? Hi, David. Uh, yep. Uh, you, you've hit the nail on the head. You mentioned the word benefits. I'm just... I tried to get on this afternoon... I'd like one of these Remainer people to tell me one country where I can go and claim working tax credit, child tax credit, child benefit, housing benefit, council tax support, subsidised health care, of, of, or mm. free health care, free prescriptions, uh, and a whole host of other things that we give to people who come here. I went to Greece in June. I took 
travel insurance. I took A A one eleven. I took my 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 currency. I took nothing from Greece. I gave to the Greece economy, but I took nothing out. That's the difference, and nobody seems to. I'd love a Remainer to come up with one country where I can go and get what the people that come here can get. No wonder people want to come. We're the land of milk and honey to people in Europe. They love it. Well, it's the in-work benefits too, David, as you've mentioned as part of your well, list. Credit, yep. Yeah. No, 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 you're absolutely right. And I, look, I, you know, frankly, if we have genuine shortages of labour, although I get really angry about some of this, because why are we not training up our own nurses, doctors, engineers and all the rest of it? If we've got genuine shortages of labour, we need foreign people to come into our country to work. That's fine. But surely they should have their own health insurance and, as you say, not be a burden on the system. The problem is, David, our system, our welfare system, is non-contributory. And yeah. much of the rest of Europe is very different. That's the difference. And nobody seems to... I've been on here before and I've said that and they've come back and said, oh, the contributory benefits are good. They are. They're better than ours. But the means-tested ones, but more or less, don't exist in Europe. And what about a cut-off date, David? I mean, Ruth, my last caller, said, well, of course we're going to end free movement when we leave, but nowhere have I seen this government tell me a single way in which they propose. I, I, think, I think they're scared of it, David. Well, they, they, they're very vague and very sketchy about a lot of things because, as you know, Theresa May wants to kick it backwards and backwards and backwards so that she doesn't have to make a decision about anything. It should be... Main, uh, March 19th, when we're officially leaving. It should be, but David, it's not going to be. Thank you. Alexander says, and it rather agrees with David Jones, MP, he says, I never thought I'd see the day that a British government put the rights of foreign citizens over the rights of British citizens. What a disgrace. But Richard on Facebook says, it would be good if the UK could set an example for a change. Well, that is exactly what the government are trying to do. They should have done this, Richard, at the start of the process. That was the one big offer to put into the middle, and after that we should have played hardball. In fact, we've done everything the wrong way. Round, you're listening to the Nigel Farage Show exclusively on LBC, and it's now 7.15. Well, the government are, are saying, regardless if there's a no deal, all EU citizens, all 3.8 million, which is now the number, will be allowed to stay, plus they'll be able to bring their spouses, their close family members, and there is no cut-off date being suggested of any kind at all, as there has not been at any point since June 23rd, 2016. Before that, a quick note. Uh, some are saying it's great news for Greece today. Really exciting, happy news for Greece, because they've ended this emergency Eurozone bailout programme. It ended today, um, and that's great because it's taken them eight years to pay back this 70-odd billion euros. So everything's fine, is it? Do you know the Greek economy is now 25% smaller than it was eight years ago? Even at the depths of the American Depression of the 30s, and buddy, can you spare us a dime, the contraction there from the top to the bottom after the Wall Street crash was 16%. We've seen Greece becoming a third world country before our eyes. And spare a thought for ordinary citizens. Spare a thought for pensioners. So eight years ago, the average old age pension in Greece was about 1,200 euros a month. It is now less than 700 euros a month. And all of it to repay money to prop up French and German banks who'd made loans to Greece. It's not Greece that was being bailed out with taxpayers' money from Europe. It was the banks in France and Germany. In the last year or two, there's been a little bit of growth in Greece. But for me, the whole thing is a Greek tragedy. They should never have joined that currency. And you might remember, they voted for a government that said they'd do something about it. Do you remember Mr Varoufakis, the finance minister, walking up Downing Street wearing a donkey jacket? I thought, whoa, this is the real deal. And yet they crumbled. They collapsed in the face of EU bullying and they put their country through years of misery. I tell you what, this new Italian government isn't going to do that. They already were saying they're going to have a budget that is bigger than the European Central Bank, or in particular the Germans, want. And now, in the wake of that horrendous bridge collapse in Genoa, they are saying, because of the sheer number of bridges across Italy, because of its topography, they're going to spend €80 billion Euros on top of their budget over the next few years on infrastructure projects. And I have to say, I think we're entering a period in the Eurozone of great indiscipline. People in the future are not going to do what Greece have done. They're not going to play 
by the rules. So, the moral high ground, that's what the government have got, but they've got nothing in return for it. There's no cut-off date. They can bring their extended families and they're open to the benefit system. Is this a good deal? Does it make sense? What does Robin in Kingsbury think? Good evening, Robin. Good evening, Nigel. Um, what I find sort of peculiar is that after the Brexit vote, the government didn't suddenly say, well, in three months' time, there would be a cut-off date, and that would be it. Mm -hmm. They didn't think about doing that. Now, any, any European citizen who's been here before that date has the right to stay here. I don't think it's very fair to kick anybody out. Absolutely, Robin, and I always agree with that. Um, but the other thing that I'd like to point out is... Um, those of us, those Brits who are married to non-EU, non-British citizens are having a hard time bringing our spouses into this country, yet anyone who is from the European Union who are living here and can bring their spouse in living on a very minimal wage, there is no control of that. Yes, that's right. I mean, if you've got a non-EU spouse, Robin, you have to show you're earning a reasonable sum of money every year to be allowed to do that, don't you? Yes, but an EU citizen doesn't. No, absolutely. That's absolutely right. And so what we've done, Robin, with the entire system, the entire immigration system, we've become very tough on non-EU because of the sheer open door and the sheer numbers that have been coming since 2004 from the EU. And we have a, in a sense, Robin, we have a, an immigration system uh, that is biased towards white Europeans against people coming in from the rest of the world. Well, it's biased against a British citizen, because as a British citizen, I've married someone who is not from the EU or who is British, uh -huh. who has a very well-paid job, who has saved, saved money, who wants to bring the money over here and for us to live here. Yet I can't do that because the British government says, oh, no, sorry, you have got to earn a certain minimum amount of money. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, Robin, I'm aware of that. What do you think she should have said? To, or, I mean, OK, it's a leak. But what do you think the government should be doing in the event of a deal or no deal? Well, they, they, they've straight... I mean, the, the very first things they should have done when the Brexit deal came out is, one, talk to the farmers, can we feed ourselves if we don't get a good deal? That's number one, because this country's got to feed itself. Number two, have a cut-off date and say, anyone, say, in that sept September that year, by September the 1st, if, they're not, if they haven't come in by September the 1st, and of course, we might have had a rush coming in. Yeah, we might. Um, that's your cut-off date. Anyone before that can stay there. Anyone after that... That depends, and we can. I lived in Singapore for seven years, and you have there, there are two types of uh, ID cards there. There's a resident, a per, uh, uh, someone who's a Singaporean, has a certain type of card, and a permanent resident, which I was, has a certain type of card. And you come in there, you either set up your own business or yep. you get a your job. Why we can't have that here, I have no idea. What, what's so so difficult about an ID card that shows you whether you're a resident or? Well, I think we're going to have to. He I, I, yeah. I, mean, I think we are going to have to head towards that. And Robin, the food one's a funny one because we do import food from the European Union, but equally, we, we, you know, we import food from the rest of the world. We when we import fifty percent of our food, I know, I know, we do. And when we joined the when we joined the common market, we were told cheaper food. It actually became more expensive food. So food prices went up to join, and now they're telling us if we leave, we'll have more expensive food. And the truth of it, actually, Robin, is we could bring tariffs down on non-EU food from around the world. So we're not going to starve. We could even get cheaper food. Robin, thank you. Your point is an utterly fair one. This Parliament is out of control. Conservative, Labour or Liberal, they have no feeling of responsibility to the people of this country, says Arthur in Brighton. Allowing EU citizens to stay without any guarantee that Brits living in Europe will have the same rights is madness and shows how much of a soft touch we currently are. Nigel, didn't we vote leave? Question mark. As soon as Article 50 was done, the borders should have been closed and a responsible immigration policy implemented. Yeah, listen, you know, I, I, I agree with all of you on this but they've done none of it they've done nothing on this issue for well over two years and now we learn regardless whether there is a deal or there isn't a deal 3.8 million people will be allowed to stay allowed to bring their families allowed to use the benefit system and there is no cut-off date proposed if we have a deal the cut-off, well, if we have a deal, free movement continues until at least the end of the transition period, that's the end of 2020. If there's no deal, well, we've not been given any date at all. I think it is absolutely pathetic. What does Carl, a new caller from Orpington, make of it all? Good evening, Carl. Yeah, hello, Nigel. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about your comments about low skill workers. Uh, your immigration control argument would mean that uh, you would want to attract high skill workers, uh, professionals, to come into the country. But the big problem with that is that Europe's biggest problem, and our biggest problem, is that we have an ageing population. And because we have an ageing population, 
these professionals that you want to bring in, they have smaller families. Uh, and, uh, you know, because uh, because, because, you know, because of the, uh, you know, the, the, the time that they have to work and, you know, the hours and uh, the commitments and all, you know, and everything else that's associated with that, they generally have smaller families. That So then how does that, how does that solve the aging population? Well, Carl, I hear that argument, but let me just say this to you, that is Britain, I mean, what's our population now? 66, 67 million, but really it's 70, or it's getting on for 70, and some people think it's even much higher than that. You know, is our quality of life better with the high 60 millions than it was in the high 50 millions? I would suggest it isn't. Uh, and this argument, we have to keep having young people because of an ageing population. Well, don't young people get old too? And isn't it possible, Carl, that with uh, health changes, uh, that actually people's working lives could be extended a lot more in the future? A little bit like semantics, to be honest with you. I mean, the bottom line is that the biggest problem we have, I reiterate, is an ageing population. A high, high professional, selective high professional skilled workers coming into the country on this immigration control argument it isn't going to solve that problem uh, in fact it's going to create a bigger problem. Uh, and uh, what you're not seeing is the fact that we have to solve the aging population because obviously uh, we're not generating enough income generators to produce the tax to look after the ah but that's where but that's where professionals who were entrepreneurs who earn a lot of money would help surely towards that problem rather than a lot of low skilled people not really paying much tax yeah, but what percentage of those high-skilled people that you are, are you talking about as being entrepreneurs? I mean, we're talking uh, engineers, we're talking doctors, we're talking all these types of people that are not yeah. necessarily well, I'm, I, associated I, I, with, um, you know, kind of private enterprise. I, I must, I, I must admit, Carl, I was very, I was very shocked, um, very shocked yesterday when we talked about this, um, and I've ch checked these numbers since. Twenty-eight percent of our doctors are foreign, right? In the Netherlands, it's three percent, and across the rest of Europe, it's five or six percent. So, so yeah, actually, you know, we should be training our own people. Carl, listen, I haven't got a problem with immigration. I haven't got a problem with filling gaps in the market, whether it's skilled or unskilled. I haven't got a problem with that. What I have got a problem with is people coming to work, having the automatic right to settle and bring their family. And I think, Carl, if we follow the logic of your argument which is we have to keep replacing, replacing, replacing because of an ageing population, we'll finish up a few years down the road with a population of 75 million and actually our quality of life diminished. The question that you raised a moment ago, um, you know, Nigel, the, the fact of the matter, the reason we're not training our people is because of the poor standards of education we have in the United Kingdom. We're bringing people in from other countries that have a, a better educational system. But we're turning away, Carl. We're turning... I mean, you know, we had a, we had, we had a woman on the, on, 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 yesterday on the phone whose daughter had been refused medical college. She'd got three A's at her, in, in her A-levels and been refused a place. The fact is, and what, I, what I've learned about this, you know, more in the last 24 hours than I had in the years before, is that actually it's quite expensive to train people to do doctors, and we're dodging it and relying on getting people in from abroad. I think we're doing down our own people, Carl. Yeah, but <laughs> what, are, you, are you wanting to kind of replace the admissions officer at the university or the, the school? or? Medical? I just want us to invest in our people for the future. Carl, I've got to end it. I'm out of time. Thank you. We could have spoken for hours. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show. It's 7.30 and time for the news. Does it make sense in the event of a no-deal Brexit for the government to say to 3.8 million EU citizens, that's fine, you can all stay here, you can bring your families, you can use the benefit system, the health service, and to have got nothing in return whatsoever for you? UK citizens living in the rest of Europe? That's the question. Before I get there, I was amused. Andrew Pearce, who of course is on LBC on Friday evenings, um, had a column in today's Daily Mail. A very interesting piece of news. The former head of BBC Television News, Roger Mosey, has said that the corporation, the BBC, leans so far to the left that it often topples into propaganda. And he talks about the BBC's obsession with Boris Johnson, you know, on the burqa, just saying days and days of headlines, and yet nobody actually asking Boris his views on the single market or the World Trade Organization. Um, and he, you know, he says that for years the BBC has failed to give sufficient prominence to leave voices. Um, and Roger Mosey saying this, you know, I can go way back to 2005. There was a big independent report, and the BBC said themselves, hands up, 
we've got this wrong, we've not been covering Europe correctly, we will change, and here we are. It's 2018, and their former head of news says that nothing has changed. Graham sends me a text. He says, Nigel, come on, I'm on tenderhooks. It was announced on the news. You were re-entering frontline politics. Is this true? Well, Graham, if you were a listener to the Sunday show, we did discuss this and I challenged people to ring up and some of them really did come on and challenge. Um, Graham, what I've said is I'm getting involved with a campaign called Leave Means Leave. It's a cross-party campaign. It's of no party and people from all parties and what we're trying to do is to get the Brexit debate going again in the country. So much of the Brexit debate is what is going on in Westminster, within political parties. Much of it used by people to jockey for position because they want to lead this or lead that. And the people not being engaged, Graham, are ordinary voters. So we're going to have public rallies up and down the country, some dates to be announced within the next week, um, battle buses, all the rest of it. I think if the people speak on this, the politicians might think, do you know what? If we really do sell them out on Brexit, there'll be a terrible price to pay. And I want them to understand that. Anybody uh, listening to that that wants to challenge me on it? 0345 6060 973. Back to the British government. Does it make sense to have done this at this time? David is a new caller, and he's calling from the Tatra Mountains in Slovakia. David, I've never had a call from Slovakia before. Good evening. Good evening to you, mate. So you're a Brit... Um, Are you a Brit living out there, David? That's right, yeah. Lived here 16 years nearly. Right, so how do you feel about this proposal? Okay. Um, I voted Leave. Yep. Um, UK needs to be out of the EU for all the right reasons. Mm -hmm. Love the Slovak people, love the Europeans, and I agree with you 100% that those that came to the UK legally have every right to remain there. Mm -hmm. What is gutting me but as an ex-serviceman, does not surprise me in the least, is the UK government cravenly backing down without putting a fight up for its own people in Europe. I'm just totally disgusted with them. And do you, David, as someone living in Slovakia, does that concern you for your own position? Oh, yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. I mean, heaven knows what's going to happen. I mean, what do you do, um, David? <clears throat> Oh, I'm retired now. So you're there. So you're there spending your money. Yeah. And if you, and if you use the health service, the British government pay the bill. Uh, no, I pay for. I pay my own way. You pay your own way. I, Fine. Just like a Slovak citizen, I'm you know being resident here. I'm required to take out um, insurance, which I pay for from my own pocket. Um, yeah. And that's what I do. I wouldn't have thought there's really much problem with you being there. I I, 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 I can't see Slovakia not wanting you there. Can you? Um, no, not at all. But, but the thing is, but you'd rather, it's, it's, but you'd rather the British government had argued your corner for you. Totally, totally. Mm, mm. But I'm not surprised that they don't. Well, I, David, I. Not only that, but and I said this to a caller to Ruth earlier. We've not seen in two years a single proposal for how they will tackle in the future free movement. There was some vague talk that people might have to register, but there'd still be no limit. Um, David, immigration is something that the mainstream politicians in Britain are too scared to touch. Totally. I'm afraid. Totally. But, uh, yeah. um, and tell us quickly, David, what is life like in Slovakia? It's superb. Is it's it? It's great. The, uh, I'm up here in the mountains, some are Mediterranean, and in the winters I've got a metre and a half of snow. So what's the, what would the temperature be today over there? Um, just a minute. Helen, what was the temperature today? <laughs> Come on, Helen, what is it? Say again. <laughs> 36. 36, wow. Well, that, well, even we didn't quite reach that at the top of our heat wave. David, thanks for your call. And David saying he's not surprised, but surely they should have at least put a word in for people like David, retired in Europe, spending their money, but they haven't done so. Mark is a new caller from Nuneaton. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Nigel. Um, I just want to follow up on the quote that you made at the opening of the show regarding yeah. this possible leaked document. Yeah. I just want to ask, being from Northern Ireland myself, but now living um, here in the UK, but having the majority of my family back there, do you think this will solve the Northern Ireland border issue? 
well, you better ask the government that, not me. Um, I, I, quite frankly, Mark, I haven't understood from the start what the Northern Ireland thing was all about, other than Monsieur Barnier using it, um, making a huge issue out of it, and the British government throwing their hands up in horror and saying, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, getting boxed in so much in December that she agreed to this bizarre backstop that would leave us in full regulatory alignment. I mean, I, I think with Ireland, Mark, it's a very different situation, isn't it? You know, we've had... You know, we've had this common travel area with Ireland, you know, since the, separa- yeah. since the separation of the countries. We already have huge differences north and south of the border, different currency, different tax rates. I, I honestly think this has been whipped up uh, to be some kind of crazy uh, sort of... They've put it up. Here's an insoluble problem. Uh, and actually what we've got to say is we've no intention of putting in place a hard border. That's my feeling. I mean, how do you feel about it, Mark, as, as somebody from Northern Ireland? Um, I, I think certainly when the Good Friday Agreement came about that it, it created a, a way forward for the people of Northern Ireland. And I think, you know, certainly when I go back um, to see my family and with my partner, we love being there. It's such a vibrant place to be now and it's come a long way. It has, yeah. What I would say is um, I think Karen Bradley needs to get off the pot. She's been in the position for whatever amount of time she's been there and there's still no power sharing executive i think if that was the case then it might be great but i've got a different opinion on the dup propping up theresa may i don't think it's right i don't think it should be happening and i think almost that northern ireland in a way is in this whole thing is being a bit used as collateral damage yes yes um, i would agree with that very... i would agree with that completely and it's monsieur barnier above all i think was done it mark i thank you marianne says if it's not reciprocated absolutely not referring to the government saying you can all stay but we're not going to ask for anything back in return if they meet the needs of the economy yes well we have a skill shortage yes for any other reason no well dave you know a skill shortage you know, it can be somebody getting a work permit to come for a year, not necessarily having the automatic right to settle and bring their family. This is the problem. The distinction between work and settlement has been completely lost with the European Union. The reason that most people voted to leave was uncontrolled immigration, and yet the government are choosing to ignore this. Mark, on Twitter, I agree with you completely. Mr Farage, can you remind me whether we, the citizens of the UK, put a tick or a cross in the boxes given to decide on whether we stayed in or came out of the European Union. Well, you know, you'd have thought for much of what Mrs May has done in the last couple of months that we'd voted to remain. And in fact, Andrea Jenkins, backbench Tory MP, said in Prime Minister's questions, could the Prime Minister please tell us at what point did, did leave become remain? Let's go to Nicholas in Rotherham. Nicholas, hello. Hi, uh, um, I'd like to ask, um, while she's giving away to Europeans all these rights to bring everybody they want here, what about our rights to bring our families here? Mine's split across the world. I'm disabled. I'll never meet Theresa May's minimum threshold for your family. Um, My son's here because he's of school age. I couldn't look after both of my kids. My daughter's over there with my wife. Who's, who's Who's letting us come together? Who's... Well, if your wife's a UK, if is your wife a UK citizen, Nicholas? Or? No, she's a Thai citizen. Oh, well, then you've got a problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah then exactly. it, I'm disabled. I'll never meet that cab. Yeah, we'll, we'll be split forever until I'm retired. I mean, I would have thought and hoped that if you're disabled and unable to work, that that might be a way around it. But I, it's hey, not, no. it's not. No, we've been to we've been to the immigration and everything about that before. In, in Thailand, you have to apply in that country. Uh, when I went to the with all the paperwork, they told me unless you've got um, enough money to show you can keep her for the next couple of years, mm. you've got no chance. And yet, if you'd married a Romanian, Nicholas, there'd be no problem, would there? Uh, exactly. Yeah. So, you, so I mean, you're basically feeling the whole thing's unfair. Yeah, I feel it would be, they're doing the same to Brits in Europe, they're doing the same to Brits. They're doing, they basically just forget about us all the time. Hmm. 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 Yeah, no, Nicholas, look, uh, you're the second caller tonight, made a very similar point, and it, we seem to discriminate Funny word, that, isn't it? <gasps> Discrimination. We discriminate openly in favour of anyone that comes from Europe and against anyone that comes from the rest of the world. Why does nobody ever say 
that the British government discriminates in favour of white Europeans and against people of colour from the Commonwealth. Oh, no, better not say things like that. Too difficult, too awkward. You're listening to the Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's 7.45. Is it right? We guarantee the rights of 3.8 million European citizens, the number set, of course, to rise, and we don't demand anything back for Brits living across the rest of Europe. Before I get to that, a little bit of a row breaking out in the Conservative Party. I mean, nothing new there, you say. But two pro-Remain MPs, Philip Lee and Anna Soubry, uh, worried uh, about the Leave.EU Aaron Banks campaign, who are urging everybody to join the Conservative Party. They, they claim their backers are flooding into the Conservative Party. The idea is they'll get rid of Mrs May and they'll get a Brexit, proper Brexit, Prime Minister. Anna Soubry says, some of it are people who, over Europe, no longer supported us, went off to UKIP and now they're coming back. Philip Lee says, it's time to wake up and act against the hard right momentum within the Conservative Party. And in fact, George Freeman, former head of Downing Street, says we must resist pressure from Nigel Farage to distort Conservative membership. George, I'm nothing to do with it, matey. I'm not advocating that people join the Conservative Party, not under Mrs May. You must be joking. And would I, I mean, if I think back over the years, the referendum party in UKIP being outside the Conservative Party exerted huge pressure, much more than they could ever have done from within. And if people followed Aaron Banks' advice and everyone left UKIP and joined the Tory party, they'd be over the moon because the one party that they fear could do them electoral damage would have disintegrated. If there is going to be a leadership election in the Tory party, my guess is, I'm amazed it's lasted this long, my guess is it would happen at around about the time of the Tory conference. But folks, if there is a contest that gets triggered in early October, you have to be a Tory party member for three months before you're able to take part in the process. But, you know, I do understand the argument, which is, well, the hard left, through, momen through momentum, have entered the Labour Party and taken it over. Maybe the same could be done with the Conservative Party. That's if enough people wanted to do it. But if that meant the end of UKIP, I don't think that makes an awful lot of sense. Lynn on Facebook says, taking back control was the mantra. We can't even control our prisons. Lynn, I have to say, we nearly did debate that issue this evening. You know, the idea that the um, fumes from drugs were so strong that it was physically affecting prison officers on those wings. I mean, what on earth have we come to? Anyway, we're discussing the British government and their offer, and Peter is a brand new caller from Manchester. Good evening, Peter. Uh, hi, hi, Nigel. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. So what is your perspective on this, Peter? I, I sort of half, well, de I half detect an EU accent there. <laughs> yes, I'm from Romania, basically. So, right. Yeah, I'm, I'm from Romania. I'm living here in the UK, so I'm very happy with the country and all that, obviously. Uh, I own a business here, and um, but basically I do agree with you. We should have been more more harsh with the EU in, the, in these negotiations, because I live here and I want the best for this country now, so we have to negotiate, uh, be harsher in negotiations with, with the EU. So. And how many Romanians are here now, Peter? Uh, I can't say exactly, but could be like half a million, maybe something up to a <laughs> well, million. Well, I'll tell you what. When I said yeah. that I thought quarter of a million would come, they all, the mainstream media, screamed yeah. blue murder. I was exaggerating. I was scaremongering. Yeah. It's about 420,000. It's about 420,000. But, Peter, that's who we know of. So, huge numbers yeah. of cars. And, and I do understand, because I've been to Romania, I've seen some pretty poor uh, parts of Romania, and I do understand life is better, but we do need to have some degree of control, and yet it yeah, seems, and, and yet it seems, Peter, the open door's just going to continue. It, it has to be about quality of immigration in general, anywhere in the world, so it's, it's not just, you know... Uh, my I argument, know, yeah, yeah, I mean, Peter, my uh, argument is, yeah. my argument is, we should not be discriminating in favour of people from oh, Romania yeah. and against people from India or Australia. Yeah, should be uh, everybody should be equal. I, 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 yeah. I and what is your business, Pisa? Uh, graphic design, 3D design, and things like that. So. Um, and life's pretty good, huh? Creative agency. Yeah. So good. what I'm seeing at the moment is that, as you said before, it's we don't do enough to invest in our people here. No. So yeah. what, I have a small business. I'm trying to invest a lot in, into training people locally, and you know they, they do quite better quite good if you if you put the effort and money and you invest into them well it sounds uh, like you're it sounds yeah. like you're investing in the country peter in every way thank you yeah. 
Thank you for your call. I got a message here from John in Chelmsford who says, regarding the comments made today from some of your callers about looking after the elderly, I'm 77 years of age, I've worked all my life since the age of 15, and I'm still working today, even on my birthday. Happy birthday, John. Uh, I've not been looked after by the system. Um, what more do some of your callers expect from the elderly like myself, who have contributed all our lives, received nothing in return? Why do we need to import people to care for the elderly? Well, it's a very, very interesting point, John. John, you are clearly, if you're working at 77, one of those people who is relatively fit and healthy. Not everybody, of course, is as fortunate as you, and it is difficult to get people to work within the care system. But the argument that keeps getting made, John, is ageing population, we have to just have more and more and more and more people. And my feeling is, if we go towards 70, 75 million, it's the quality of life that will diminish. Lucas says on Facebook, after a no-deal Brexit, I think most of the low-skilled, low-paid labour will leave anyway. To know, Lucas, that there have been slightly fewer people coming, net, from the European Union since Brexit, but it's not massive, and I'm not convinced. I'm actually not convinced. I think if you have come here from Romania and you're doing OK, I don't think you're going to go back in a hurry. That's, at least, that's my feeling. What does Thomas in Worthing make of the government's position? Thomas, good evening. Good evening. Uh, bearing in mind that this is a, a, a leaked paper or a leaked information, yes. I think it is utterly ludicrous. Had the government come out at the beginning of this negotiation process and said, we're taking the moral high ground with this one, yep. a- anybody who comes to the UK from the EU legally um, before the cut-off point for Article 50 is allowed to stay here uh, indefinitely, and we would hope that the EU would do the same for our UK expats they would actually be able to take the moral high ground. But yet again, we've got another leaked piece of information yep. that completely <clears throat> destroys any possibility of them taking any kind of a moral high ground well, uh, on the negotiations. Thomas, it would have been a moral high ground if it hadn't been seen to be a bargaining chip for the last two years. That's the point, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. I mean, that is exactly. the point. So now it doesn't look like a moral high ground. Now it looks like a further surrender because they're asking for nothing in return. There's no cut-off day. I mean, Thomas... They've got the whole negotiation wrong, in my view. Well, I mean, and I would also like to know where all of these leaks keep coming from, because I I noticed nothing positive about Brexit is being leaked from the government, and yet anything that's negative or can impact the negotiations negatively um, is leaking out of the government quicker than the colonel. Well, yeah. It's just ridiculous. But that's because the civil service, who are supposed to be neutral, are, of course, hugely, hugely pro remain uh, and my goodness me they really really are if i if i fancy getting a bit of abuse thomas i just go and stand at Hupper states nine o'clock in the morning outside one of the big civil service offices and there's torrents of abuse i get it's quite extraordinary they are pro remain that's where your leaks are coming from i believe that thomas thank you time for one last caller very quickly mika who's a new caller from belvedere yes, that's me hello boss. good evening boss you are the biggest boss Right. Okay. You are the biggest boss. Yeah, I'm telling you now, I want the whole world to hear it. Right, well, very okay. very kind of you, Mika. So what about the government? Are they doing the right thing, in your view? Um, like, no. Right. So what, sh- what should you they... Went, you, went, you went and became a member of parliament in EU. Yes. And you told the world mm-hmm. what's going to happen. Yeah? Well, I did my best, and yes. Yeah. And it happened. Yeah. Yeah. You are the biggest boss. Well, that's fine, yeah. Mika. But we've got to sort this mess out. And I'm not the I'm, I'm not the prime minister. So what do we need no, the no, no, What, what do we need the prime be. minister to do, Mika? Um, we need her to step down and let you step into her shoes. Right. Okay. Well, that's a great. Uh, 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 one minute. I, I've got to say something. Yeah, go on. Right. First and foremost, I'm second generation black. Uh huh. It needs to be known, all right? Yep. So no one can play the race cards because apparently a black person can't be racist. Right. Which we can. Yeah? But I, I'm putting it how, how it is. You need to step into her shoes. Take over this government. You are our idol. 
Well, Mick, I am, I am, I am flattered um, uh, hugely by your call. I want to thank you. You sound like a complete star. Be great fun to meet you. I'm sure it'll be good fun too. I- I'm going to go off and have a drink and think about this proposal. I'm not sure it's very practical. Be quite fun though. Hey, I'll be back tomorrow evening at seven at ten o'clock tonight. It's Ian Collins. But up next, it's Clive Bull. Nigel, thank you. Uh,